Welcome back everybody for the last session. So first off we've got Susan Harkness. Susan is a professor of social policy at the University of Bristol, visiting <coughs> professor at the Centre for Analysis and Social Exclusion at LSE, and the research lead for labour markets and institutions at the ESRC Research Centre for Micro Social Change at the University of Essex. Her research examines how gender and family structure relate to labour market opportunities, income inequality and poverty. So over to you, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> OK, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yeah, we can. Yes. OK, great. OK, um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so as you said, I'm Susan Harkness. I'm, I'm at the University of Bristol. Um, and today I just want to talk about gender equality um, within the household. Um, so I think this is something that is perhaps a little bit um, under-researched um, and has potentially important implications for how we think about poverty and so on. Let me just quickly go to the motivation. Um, actually, before I sort of get too far, let me also just say that this is very, very much work in progress and the results are, are very preliminary. Um, so certainly not for citation at the moment and we're still very much working on on uh, thinking, well, thinking about thinking about the, the data and also the modelling. OK, um, so in terms of uh, motivation, we know that sort of traditional models of household protection, of course, assume that men specialise in work and women specialise in ice and home protection, um, particularly after children are born, and that resources are shared within the household. Now, of course, as more and more women have entered into the labour market, and in particular mothers have um, increased their labour force participation, we know that this is going to have affected both the composition of family income, but also potentially the way in which families organise their finance. Um, so that's essentially what I want to look at today is whether women's increased participation or actually more specifically women's increased earnings is affecting the ways in which families manage their, their finances. Now, there's been some past work on this, um, so in particular the work of um, Manny Khan and Heather Laurie looked at, um, for example, changes in savings and investment holdings of um, men and women in couples. And uh, recently, Yang Hu has also looked at uh, cohort changes in patterns of money management. OK, um, now, why do I think this is important? Well, one of the reasons it's potentially very important is because whilst we've had the introduction of independent taxation in 1990, where men and women are treated um, separately um, in terms of their assessments of income, as um, recent, well, recent um, changes over recent decades have meant that we are seeing for those on low and in increasingly middle incomes are increasingly being drawn into means testing, particularly if they have children. Um, and this means that um, people's access to a income is really very dependent on what's happening within the household. So it's potentially important implications for what happens within the households and money management. Um, OK, so the specific question I want to think about is whether the sources of household income affect patterns of, sh of sharing. Um, so my research questions are essentially two. Um, the first is, have the ways in which couples manage their finances changed over recent decades? And does the source of money affect the ways in which um, finances are organised? And then I also want to think a little bit about whether this matters. Does it matter how, how um, household finance is organised? And I'm going to think about this in two ways. I'm going to think about, first of all, how it impacts individuals' perceptions of financial stress, and secondly, how it impacts their psychological well-being. Um, of course, there are many other ways you could think about this, but they tend to be including measures of deprivation. But unfortunately, in the data that we have, um, that's not something um, we're able to do. Um, OK, um, just very, very briefly um, in terms of prior research, we know that there's been considerable attention to uh, gender, gender pay gaps and indeed motherhood pay gaps. Um, but there's been far less attention to what those changes in gender and motherhood, essentially wage gaps, which are typically looked, as, looked at, has for um, 
how, how individuals do within the within the household. Um, so in particular, what I um, could want to be concerned about is financial inequalities within families. Um, and we know that financial inequality uh, within couples matters. Um, so there's work that goes back to the 1980s and 1990s, particularly the work of Jan Powell, which I think was quite influential in um, how we think about female poverty and suggesting that the distribution of resources within households um, matters. And more recently, the work of um, Elena Karagiannaki and Tanya Burkett has looked at deprivation within households in Europe. And they essentially find that if we looked at deprivation and measure it at an individual level, we would have considerably higher estimates of the numbers of people who are deprived. Um, so again, suggesting that um, household resources are not um, always equally shared. And then there's also increasing interest in this question. I think in the US, we know that financial inequality has wider sets of outcomes. It's linked to poorer relationship quality, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, it's also linked to divorce um, when, for example, savings and investments are held in separate names. Um, but there's also links, uh, wider links, I think, to uh, indicators of child well-being and what is spent on children. OK, um, what else do we know about financial inequality? Well, we know that um, Jan Powell um, and Carl Vogler argued that there was financial inequality uh, varied across household income. And she actually argued that financial inequality was greatest amongst those with lower incomes. Um, and she also found that having access to an independent income did not necessarily improve equality within the household. So. Of course, this was data from some time ago and female employment has changed considerably since then. So what I want to think about is how that these findings sort of resonate today. Um, and the other area I want to look at um, is how changing family forms matter. So in particular, we've seen that a rise in cohabitation, so move away from marriage, and an increasingly number, increasing number of um, sort of um, complex families. So by which I mean um, families where there are stepchildren, there may be children um, belonging to both or both parents or biological parents, but there are also increasingly um, families where there are stepchildren present. OK, and evidence from the US suggests that in these families uh, there may be less sharing. Um, so I want to also uh, have a look and see whether that's the case in the UK. So data, the data comes from understanding society and I'm going to look at couples, only those with children. Um, mostly I'm going to focus on the results for women um, to look at the sharing outcomes. Um, I'm also um, in some of the final results, I'll also look at um, how sharing affects outcomes for men. Um, and just to say the sharing information that we have is available in 2012 and 2016. Um, that's the data I'm going to focus on. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, and we have reasonably large uh, sample sizes. So it's around seven and a half thousand um, in those two years for women and a similar number for men. OK, um, so when I started off thinking about this, we wanted to look at two indicators of financial arrangements. One was money management, and that's what I'm going to look at today. Um, we also wanted to think a bit about um, savings and debt and who hold, help, hold savings and debts within couples. Um, but we haven't actually managed to really get to grips with separating the data in understanding society. Um, and we may we may find that, um, in fact, we will we'll be looking at um, other, other um, data sources. OK, money management. So uh, variable on money to management is available. There's this question asked on money management in the early part of the BHPS and then again in 2006, uh, 12 and 16. Now, the years 2006, 12 and 16 have a consistent measure. There's a slight change in the variable um, beforehand, so I'm not going to use that information. Now, I've used this question on who manages uh, the household finances um, to code uh, four separate variables, which are really very, very similar to those that were originally collected. Um, so households are asked about, or individuals are asked about how um, closely their perception of money management relates to these various uh, forms of money management. And the options are there's complete pooling. So we've got joint financial management. 
Um, there is a female control where the woman uh, manages the money and the man, man um, is has is given spending money or uh, this is also merged with um, data data on whether they have a housekeeping allowance, which obviously now seems quite old fashioned, but um, that's, that's the, also an option that was allowed. Um, and then we have male control. So the men manage uh, money and women get spending money. And then we have a category which we, I'm going to call independent or separate finances, where we have either complete separation of finance, which, which is in fact very, um, very, very rare, or we have part pooling and um, the literature around this suggests that when part money is partly pooled, this is typically um, reflects independent sort of uh, decision making about um, money, money and spending in the household. So we have this category of independence or uh, lot, which we can also think of as largely separate decision making over um, finances. OK, um, in terms of models, I'm just going to um, I'm going to run multinomial logic models um, against the base um, where um, income is pooled, where we look at the sort of types of household financial arrangements. Um, so that's the first type of model I'm going to run. And then the second type of model I will run is to think about how these financial arrangements affect individuals' perceptions of financial stress and psychological well-being. I'm going to have to go very quickly um, to just to, to get to the results. So in terms of variables, we've got um, I control for family income. And these are the ones I'm going to focus on um, the share of income from own earnings and the share of income from benefits. And then I'm going to also look at the, the uh, results for cohabitation and, and whether uh, the individuals have stepchildren, in fact. Um, I'm going to control for a range of other factors, background factors, so the age and of uh, the head and spouse, number and age of children, relationship satisfaction, duration, and um, how we ownership. Um, and then finally, I'm going to run these models on these outcomes where I'm going to think about uh, financial strain. I'm going to focus on the outcomes of whether individuals are finding it quite difficult or very difficult to get by um, compared to um, living comfortably or doing all right. Um, and then I'm going to finally look at an indicator for depression based on the GHQ score. So first thing to note, and this is changes over since 2006, is that money management amongst couples has shown some small but pretty gradual change. Most couples um, pool their money. And in fact, if anything, pooling has slightly um, grown over the decade. Um, the share where either um, women manage the household finances or the man uh, manages the household finances has slightly declined. But what we also see is a small increase in the separation of household finances. OK, um, and we can also see that there's some gradient this is across income deciles um, uh, across the across the distribution with more separation of finances amongst higher income families and more uh, women more likely to control the household budget in lower income families. OK, um, now the results from the model. So these are just really just picking out the coefficients that um, I want to focus on. Um, so the first thing to note is that if we think about predicting money management, we can see that if we can see that in particular, if we focus on the separation of household finances, we can see that some things matter. So having a higher income leads to a greater separation of finances. Women having a higher earning share also leads to a greater separation of finances and benefits that benefit receive the greater the share of income from benefits reduces the probability of having separate finances. Um, the other result I want to focus on is this female control and female control is also more likely where women have a higher share of the household income, but also where a higher share of that income comes from benefits. And indeed, the female share of income is really strongly related to men, not um, not being not controlling household finances. OK. Um, in terms of family structure, what matters? Well, the results I just want to pick, sorry, pick out here are again related to the separation of finances. And here we can see that when 
Um, we have cohabitation relative to marriage. Um, so cohabiting parents are much more likely to have well, more likely to have separate finances than those that are married. And stepchildren, the presence of stepchildren, even in married couples, is also really strongly linked to finances being run separately. And this, again, is after controlling for a whole host of features, including um, uh, perceptions of relationship quality, for example. Um, what does this matter? Um, so if we think about how this affects individuals' outcomes, um, one of the things we looked at was whether it affects perceptions of financial stress. And what we find here is that where couples keep their finances separate, uh, women are more likely to report difficulty managing their finances, whereas for men, there is a sort of negative coefficient. So if anything, the direction um, separating finances is, is perhaps associated with men having less, uh, less being less likely to say they are struggling financially. Um, in terms of mental health, however, we find that separate finances um, is associated with a sort of positive effect on worsening mental health. So it's associated with a greater risk of depression, uh, more significant for women than for men. OK, so just to um, conclude, um, what we find is that women have entered, women have entered the labour market, it's not a finding, um, and we show that money management has actually over the last decade has changed slightly, but not very much. Um, women in low income families and those who receive a higher share of income from benefits, we find are more likely to manage the family finances. Um, and in some ways, this seems to um, certainly relative to separate finances seem to protect women from um, from greater financial stress. Um, but it should be noted that other studies suggest that it, this doesn't necessarily mean it protects them from deprivation. Um, we know that women, for example, make choices and that those choices may, may also mean that they're more likely to be deprived of certain items. Um, women's increased earnings are associated with greater separation of family finances. And again, this resonates with Jan Panel's earlier study, where essentially you might find that whilst um, higher earnings and indeed higher income are associated with greater separation of finances, and that may mean that those in higher income households um, are also at risk of being deprived, even if their household income is is above um, the, the sort of lower level poverty levels. Um, and then finally, those who cohabit or who have stepchildren are more likely to keep their finances separate. And I think this has potentially important implications, um, not least because the cohabitees and stepchildren families are more likely to be represented in the lower part of the income distribution. Um, OK, and I will finish there. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, thank you. OK. Up next, we have Anna Nikariku. Anna, are you there? Oh, yes. hi, Anna. OK, so I'll just introduce you. So Anna is a PhD student at the University of Manchester and part of the Doctoral Training Data Analytics Society. Sorry, that doesn't make sense. Um, with a background of economics and data science, her PhD focuses on studying difference in terms of poverty and material deprivation in the UK between families raising children with disabilities and families raising children without disabilities. So if you're ready to start, Anna, that would be great. Okay, yeah, so just um, as it was mentioned, I'm Anna, I'm a PhD student at Manchester University and um, just the topic of the presentation is to look and make a comparison between families with children in the UK, uh, between those who have children with disabilities and those who don't, and I'm going to look at income poverty, uh, material deprivation and also unpaid um, care um, using data from 2018-19. So just an overview, um, so just going to go quickly to some previous research, then I'm going to present the research aim of this analysis, then the data sources, some results and just a brief conclusion and then answer some questions. 
So in terms of previous research, well, it obviously there's a lot of talk about poverty, but in 2018-19, which is the same year that I used for my analysis, um, the Social Metric Commission estimated that there were around 14.4 million people in poverty in the UK, and it's also um, 30 at that time, 33% of children were in poverty. But what's interesting to look at is how this is split. And we can see in um, the bottom half of the table that uh, actually half of the people, so 7.2 million were um, people in families that had someone um, that had a disability. So either it was an adult that had a disability in the family or a child or both an adult and a child. Um, and I guess there are various reasons why that can be. And it is known that there is a connection between poverty and disability. But one of the reasons could be to do with unpaid care, um, which it's very hard to define in a way, and it's also, I think, harder to assess and um, capture in a survey, or at least that was my, that's what I found from my research. Uh, but I guess generally unpaid care is any pay, um, any work that you take, takes time and energy and you take care of someone and you're not getting paid for it. Um, and while it's very beneficial for the society at large. It can have very negative impacts on the person who's providing care. So, for example, it can reduce the amount of time you have to be uh, to do work, to be employed. So then it has um, an impact on your um, employment and your income. Um, for example, 22% of informal carers were living below the average housing cost income in 2013-14. There's also the aspect of mental health, not just financial well-being, and in extreme cases, it can lead to social exclusion. And um, there's also, we can see that informal care in 2016 was estimated to be around 351.7 billion and this is money that should have been paid and the caregivers should have received some money and help. But this is something that the society, in a way, didn't pay for them. So it's free work. Um, and it's important to take this into consideration, maybe consider in the future what we can do about this. Um, and this is because I think at some point in our lives, everyone has to provide some form of unpaid care. Um, and there's various, various reasons why you would have to do that. Um, and one of those reasons could be disability, which again, in 2017 or 18, um, if we're looking at disabilities for children, um, families with a disabled child had a poverty rate of 26% compared to 19% of families in which no disability was present. And this could be because someone had to provide unpaid care so they weren't working, or it has to do with the cost of disability, which, for example, it's estimated to be around 581 pounds per month. Uh, but it can even go higher up. So in a report um, in their surveys, 24% of families, um, the disability costs went over a thousand pounds per month. Uh, and these are costs from which any disability benefits were deducted. And um, I guess this is to consider that some people might not be considered poor, because they have the same income level, but obviously their disposal income is different from a family who doesn't have children with disabilities. And I guess these were just some examples to look at the connection between poverty and unpaid care and poverty and disability, which has been researched before, but uh, 
this also leads to the research aim, which was to try and combine the three of them together. So I wanted to explore the three-parted relationship between poverty, unpaid care, and children with disabilities and their families, and look at various socio-demographic um, variables and the effect they have on poverty. So to do that, I used the Family Resources Survey, and it was around 551 families with dependent children. Um, and this is, uh, when I talk about families, it's not the larger family, it's the very strict family in that it's just uh, the parents and the child. So even if, I don't know, maybe you're, you live, the grandparents live in the same household, they are not considered, they're not taken into consideration in um, this uh, analysis. Um, so... The data was split in various groups, then the ones of interest were um, disability and unpaid care. Um, disability is defined according to the Equality Act, and it's just if you have um, any illness that's expected to last 12 months or more and limits your ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities. In terms of unpaid care, there is no fixed definition and it can be for many hours or only a few hours a week and included examples such as going shopping for someone or helping with paperwork or gardening but this is uh, if you're looking at children in a way you are already doing these things for them but in the frs it's also mentioned that unpaid care for people who have some form of disability but um, it's uh, debatable on how well these measures unpaid care for children and what's the difference between the normal child care and unpaid care just because the child has um, extra needs. Um, in terms of measures and outcomes of the analysis there were two of them so we used income and child material deprivation um, income is the weekly net income, it's equal, um, it uses the equivalent scale and the threshold was used for 60% of median income and the material deprivation was discussed before, it's just 21 questions about goods and services and um, it's just a score calculated and um, if uh, the score is 25 or above, then the children and their families are considered materially deprived. And these were treated as binary variables. So logistic regression um, was used to try to predict um, um, after housing cost income and material deprivation. Um, and then the data we had disability versus not disability for children in the family and unpaid care versus no unpaid care and these two were treated as both binary regresses in one analysis and then the data sets were split into these groups and then the social demographics um, effect on poverty measures were considered and compared across groups. Um, so in terms of results, in the first part, we were just looking at whether belonging to either group, um, so disability or no disability, has an effect on poverty. And this is uh, looking at all the families with dependent children. And we can see here that in terms of uh, after housing cost poverty, which is a yes or no uh, classification, we can see that actually having children with no disabilities seems to be increasing the odds of poverty by 2.17 um, times, which is quite surprising as we were expecting it to be the other way um, around. And in the second half of the table, we are interested in these results. Um, and this is just family supporting children with disabilities and we're interested in the effect of unpaid care provision 
And in this case, we can see that, again, surprisingly, providing unpaid care has uh, lower odds of um, being uh, after housing cost uh, poverty, um, which you would expect again to be the other way around that. Um, but yeah. Um, then in the second part, uh, we only looked at the difference between um, effects of various social demographics, such as the type of job you have or where, uh, whether you rent or um, what's your edu what's the parents' education and the family education level. And in this case, we look at families who support children without disabilities and those with disabilities. So the data was split into two um, groups. Um, in here, just a few points. I guess we can see that higher education has lower odds associated with uh, material deprivation for those raising children with disabilities compared to the first group. Um, and however, being of any other ethnicity than white increases the uh, chances of material deprivation by 3.2 times for those supporting children with uh, disabilities. So there's not a much difference between all the other social demographic variables available. Um, and finally, the last part was to try and look at those who only have children with disabilities and that are split between those who provide unpaid care and those who don't provide. And um, in this case, no major differences were observed between the groups. So it doesn't matter. The results were not significant in terms of what education you have or ethnicity. The um, especially when uh, we're talking about uh, after housing cost poverty. Um, the only, yeah, the only difference would be between the type of uh, renting that you have um, and that um, uh, those, for those providing unpaid care, private renting increases the odds by 7.32 times compared to only 4.6 uh, times for those not providing unpaid care. So just these two. Um, and I guess overall, just we found that social demographic factors have an effect on children's material deprivation when groups are treated independently. Uh, but in the other hand, they only have the groups, so whether you have a child with disability or not, or whether you provide unpaid care or not, has an impact on after housing cost poverty when the groups are treated as direct um, effects. Um, and this, I think, is just an initial exploration, and there were some interesting results, and I think future research needs to um, try to untangle some of the points and see how we can maybe better um, understand unpaid care for children with disabilities and how can this be measured um, and assessed. Um, that's all. Thank you, Anna. All right, next up we've got Lin Tian. Lynn is a researcher at the Centre for Personal Financial Wellbeing at Aston University. Her research focuses on household finance, financial inclusion, labour market outcomes and some topics in, on social housing and subjective wellbeing. And today she's going to talk to us about what happened to the Child Trust Fund. Welcome, Lynn. Hello, Carla. Hello, everyone. OK, so uh, the paper I'm going to present today is about the Child Trust Fund and Children's Savings in the UK. Uh, this is a paper co-authored with Professor Stephen McKay from University of Lincoln and uh, Professor Andy Lima. Both of us work for Centre for Personal Financial Wellbeing, which, is recent, which was recently launched at Aston University. And Steve is also here today, today and will join me in the Q&A. Um, so for the presentation, I'd like to start from an introduction on the Child Trust Fund. 
Um, and then we will focus on a set of research questions and the univariate and multi multivariate analysis we did to answer those questions. And finally, we will draw the conclusions and uh, uh, the policy implications. So uh, the child trust fund originated from a long existing ideas about lump sums given at ad ad adulthood. Um, this idea was brought to light in the uh, 20th century and um, was developed into the asset based welfare theory. So the basic idea is to redistribute the productive um, assets to narrow down the gap between the rich and the poor and to eliminate poverty in a preventive manner. So Child Trust Fund um, is one of the first asset based welfare policies in the world. Um, so under this scheme, the children will be given a certain amount at birth and they will take control of this amount of money when they turn 18. Um, so there were multiple objectives designed for this policy and the aim is not just to provide the kicker funds for education. Um, can you see my cursors here? No? Oh, here. OK, so um, the aim is not just to provide the kick of funds for um, education, housing or starting businesses, but probably more important is to help people understand um, the benefits of saving uh, to develop to develop saving habit and financial literacy so that they can make better financial decisions. So the Child Trust Fund was designed in such a way that for children who were eligible for this scheme, their parents and guardians were given a voucher of £250 from the government to place with the Child Trust Fund provider, such as some banks and building societies. And the amount of the voucher would, would be doubled for some families with lower income. Apart from these contributions from the government, um, the parents and wider families were also encouraged to add on to their account with a tax-free saving allowance of um, uh, £1,200 per year. So if you take advantage of the full allowance each year, that would add up to £21,600 when the children turned 18, which is a considerable kick of fund for the children. And finally, the money will be available for the children at the age of 18 when they can obtain the control of the money and choose whether to withdraw it, to spend it or to reinvest it. So this scheme was introduced under the new Labour in 2005 and was backdated to um, the children born, uh, the children who were born after September 2002. However, in 2011, the scheme was scrapped to cut the government expense in the wake of financial crisis and was later reply uh, and was later on replaced by junior ISIS. Um, and in September of 2020, the first child trust funds matured and those who turned 18 then had the control over the money. So given all these benefits came with the child trust fund and um, the government's efforts in promoting savings, the result after 18 years and not as exciting as expected. Um, according to the data we get from the HMRC um, on the market value of child trust fund, we find that yeah, we find that over 86, I mean, the distribution is highly skewed to the right and uh, about uh, more than 86% of uh, their account have less than 2,500 pounds saved in their account. And only 0.4% of the account has um, like over 20,000 pounds saved in it. Therefore, we'd like to understand what has happened to the child trust fund, whether or not it has made any difference on the level of savings and saving behaviors. If yes, to what extent and who benefits the most from the scheme? <laughs> 
Um, so there are several research questions we'd like to touch in this presentation. First, we would like to look at whether the parents are aware of the child trust fund and also whether the, the account was opened by the guardians themselves or opened by the HMRC on default. These two questions are quite interesting because um, if you are not aware of the account or didn't have much motivation to open the account by yourself in the first place, it's very unlikely that you make any further contributions and you may even lose connection to the account, which means um, the children won't be able to collect the money when they turn 18. And then we would also like to know uh, whether the parents made additional contributions and the amount of savings in the account and in other places for the children. And on top of this, we would also like to know um, if these behaviors vary across groups. So the data we used for this analysis was collected from um, the first six waves of wealth and assets survey. Um, this is a large scale longitudinal data set, uh, which was um, and the first wave was conducted in 2006 and 2008, um, which covered over 30,000 households. So the last question now was asked to the adults in the household, but since our analysis focus on the dependent children aged up to 18. So uh, in our analysis, we have to convert our data, uh, the original data into a child level longitudinal data set, uh, which means now the dependent children becomes the unit of analysis and uh, um, the information on their parents and household is matched to each child. We ended uh, we end up with over 60,000 observations, child year observations for analysis, which came from over 30,000 children and 820 of them took all the six waves of surveys and another 15, 000, over 15,000 children were only surveyed once. So let's start from the first research question. We would like to know um, why the people, parents are aware of the Child Trust Fund account. And we find that in our sample, around 15% of the eligible group seem to be unaware of their account. So this, uh, when, uh, this data is, um, well, we got this data based on the sample who was surveyed by WISE for the first time because we expected those who were surveyed for um, several times by WISE questionnaire will will become aware of the account, uh, the child trust of account during the process. So um, we uh, this data is get from a sample who was surveyed for the first time. And we know that the unawareness of the child trust fund will lead to, um, for example, missing the benefits of the tax free saving account, as well as an issue in collecting the money when the children turned 18. Actually, the account tracing issue are significant according to our conversation with staffs from HMRC, and it is estimated that um, more than 1.8 million child trust fund accounts are lost to their owners, either because their accounts were opened by HMRC on default or that the parents moved and didn't keep in touch with the child trust, a child trust fund provider. And also in our sample, we find that around 70% accounts were opened by the guardians themselves and um, this proportion is higher among the children whose parents are graduate, uh, have graduate degree or the children who, who came from families in the top third of earnings. Additionally, we find that 27% of their accounts has received contributions in the previous two years by the time of the survey. And again, we find this proportion to be higher for children who has graduate parents or for children uh, who came from families in the top third of earnings. Um, then we will look at um, the levels of total savings for children and we compare between um, the group of children who, whose parents report to hold a child trust fund, which means they are aware of the existence of child trust fund account. 
We compare this group with uh, the children who are too young to be eligible for child trust fund and those who are too old to be eligible for child trust fund. So it's not surprising to see that the children who are too young to be to be eligible have much lower savings compared to the other groups. Um, and uh, this the reason might be that they don't have much. They didn't have much time to accumulate the wealth. However, if you look at um, the graph on the right, which is um, the graph for the, those who are too old to be eligible for child trust fund, you will still find the saving level to be lower than um, the child trust fund group in the middle. OK, so if we focus on uh, the child trust fund group only in the middle, you will find the bottom quarter had done little to add to the government contribution and a slight increase from about uh, from 250 pounds to about um, 380 pounds in the savings might mostly attribute to in, um, to interest growth. This implies that they might have either lost their accounts or just were not capable to make any further contributions. And additionally, you will find a widening distribution in each of the group and the widening gap between the eligible group and the other two. However, this uh, these statistics can only take us so far because we didn't take account uh, uh, I mean, we didn't take account of the other factors that might be relevant in this context. So in the next step, we estimate a multi-level mixed effects linear model to uh, which allows for uh, the fixed effects at the children's level and the random effects at a household level, because we expect the children from the same uh, the, from the same family share some similarities. And we control for a set of uh, standard control variables such as the age and gender of the children and other variables on the parents and the household, as well as a year and the regional dummies. And we summarize the key results from um, this model um, in this table. So a dependent variable is the total levels of savings, which includes um, the savings in the child trust of child trust fund account as well as the savings saved in the other places. So we find that the eligibility of the scheme is associated with a 426 more in the total savings for the children. Uh, this is only a small amount if you compare it with the government's contributions. And focusing on the key control variables, we find that those who uh, whose parents were compared to those whose parents were married, um, the children whose parents are cohabiting or single tend to save less for them. And compared to those whose parents are graduate, um, uh, those whose parents hold lower qualifications or no qualifications at all tend to save less for them. And also compared to outright owners, um, those parents who are mortgagees or renters tend to save much less for them, uh, especially the latter. Uh, we also find that children who came from families with higher wealth and income have more saved for them, and those who come from families with heavy debt burden tend to have less in the savings. Uh, the results on these control variables highlights the cohorts of children that calls for more attention or support from the government. And besides these baseline results, we also did a set of heterogeneity analysis, and we find that the Child Trust Fund boosts children's saving the most for children who aged between uh, zero to four or have single parent or from families with low incomes. So if you combine these heterogeneity analysis and the baseline results, we will find that, um, well, those who come from families with lower socioeconomic status tend to save less, the Child Trust Fund is somehow more meaningful for um, these children. So here comes our conclusions. So first our analysis shows that um, the Child Trust Fund has increased children's savings 
but in a limited way, the improvement in total savings seems only a small amount, which is 426, compared to the initial contribution from the government. But um, put that in the context that 11% of young adults have no savings at all, and 28% um, have less than 100 savings for them. The, the Child Trust Fund at least ensures a minimum level at the age of 18. And uh, the second conclusion is that our analysis show a rather complex overall picture of child trust fund. So on the one hand, the scheme has the greatest impact on those who um, who are more disadvantaged, but many of these families are also less likely to be aware of the account and are also less capable to save. On the other hand, um, the rich and better educated families are more likely to save and to save more, therefore reaping the greatest benefits from it. Um, this is quite common for tax privilege saving policies, which always skewed to those who are more capable to save. Um, and we have to say that it's hard to find the solution to this paradox, but um, at least improving the awareness of the scheme in the first place, um, and especially for the disadvantaged families, would be a vital step. And finally, um, though the Child Trust Fund improves children's saving, the amounts are unlikely to be life changing for the vast majority. It's only like just over 400 pounds. Therefore, whether the other objectives that we mentioned, such as building up uh, the savings, uh, the saving habit and financial literacy, whether these objectives have been achieved becomes especially important. Just like the old saying that if you give a man a fish and you feed him for the day, if you teach him, teach a man to fish, then you feed him for a lifetime. So, um, this calls for special attention on the delivery of complementary policies to the Child Trust Fund scheme, such as the financial education policies. And we would be happy to see more data and research on how the young adults use this account, uh, use their account after they take control at the age of 18. Um, well, um, in a nutshell, the Child Trust Fund is a great pioneer of asset-based welfare policy, it has made a dif it has made a difference, though maybe limited and skewed. Um, but we still learned lessons from it for the future development of asset-based welfare policies. Um, I guess I should stop there. OK, thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Really interesting evaluation of that policy and, you know, lots to think about whether if it hadn't been disbanded and the promotion materials and so on had continued, then I wonder I wonder if the outcomes would have been different. Um, but it's, it's really good to see how that's all shaping up now and hopefully um, anybody thinking about policy in that area can can use the results to um, design something that potentially works better, especially with the cost of living, meaning that people saving on behalf of their children is going to be even less like. Now, last but not least, we have B Boileau. B is a research economist in the pensions and public finance sector at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. She's currently working on projects analysing intergenerational transfers, labour market activity among older workers and retirement savings. Feel free to take over, B. Hi. Um, so, as you said, I'll be talking about intergenerational transfers and life events today. Um, by these, I mean gifts and loans made during the lifetime of the giver. And these are opposed to inheritances which are made it there. But there's reason to think about looking at transfers in particular. So givers obviously have more discretion over the timing at which they make these sorts of transfers, which is kind of motivation to look at them separately. And they're also treated differently in tax terms. So inter vivos transfers in the UK face a more generous tax treatment than inheritances do, again, pointing to the fact that there's a different role played by transfers. There's reason to think that these sorts of transfers are increasingly significant. So from potential givers point of view, we see rising levels of household wealth at retirement, which might mean there's more wealth to transfer to recipients. Reforms like pension freedoms also increase the flexibility with which sums of money can be transferred at various points during retirement. From potential receivers point of view, 
there's slower income growth over time, meaning that there might be more of a role for transfers to play. And various life course events for potential receivers are becoming increasingly expensive over time. So, for example, house prices are getting more expensive. So this might point to, again, more of a role for transfers to play. In this project in particular, we're seeking to answer three key questions. Firstly, we're looking at whether these kinds of transfers are growing over time in a way that might reflect their increasing importance. We're seeking to document the characteristics of givers and receivers of these sorts of transfers. And then we're looking at the potential drivers of these transfers. So in particular, we're looking at the life events for givers and receivers that these transfers might be associated with. We've been using the Wealth and Assets Survey to investigate these questions. We've been using seven waves of it from 2006 to 2020. And in this data set, we've got questions about the size and the use of gifts and loans separately that are received. And these are gifts and loans of more than £500. And we also have more detail on givers from round seven. So this, we've got questions about giving. We've got questions about the relationship between givers and receivers. And then we've got more self-reported detail on the use of transfers, which I'll go on to talk about in more detail later in this presentation. There's been some literature in the UK context and how these transfers look. So this has largely been documenting kind of the size and prevalence of transfers and on the characteristics of receivers. And there's also been some international examination of what tends to drive these transfers, which looks at life events for receivers in general and finds that they tend to be important in driving transfers, things like marriage, divorce and childbirth. So we can look at how many people report receiving these types of transfers. And this does seem to be increasing over time in ways that might reflect the kind of increased significance that I just talked about. So you can see from this graph that about 6% of adults in the UK report having received at least one of these sorts of transfers over the last two years. But from 2017 onwards, this seems to jump upwards. And to, as you can see, it jumps to about 8% of adults in 2020. And this is largely driven by an increase in the proportion of people who report having received the gift, which is the green line on the graph whereas the proportion of adults who report having received a loan hovers around 2% and is relatively constant over time. So this, as I've said, might point to an increased significance. We can also look at how the value is changing among receivers to see if, as well as the prevalence apparently going up, the value seems to be also increasing. And it does seem as if the value of large transfers seems to be increasing over time in a way that might also reflect more of a role for these transfers to play in the UK. So the median, as you can see, has stayed roughly constant with about 50% of people receiving under £2,000 from 2010 onwards. But the mean seems to be rising somewhat, although this rise isn't statistically significant. It's slightly fluctuating around. You can also see that the mean is higher not only than the median, but than the 75th percentile, which really points to how skewed this distribution is and to how much large gifts are very large. We can look at who tends to receive these transfers as well, and I'm going to show you the average age of people who tend to be receiving. So this shows you the proportion of people who report having received one of these transfers over the age distribution. And as you can see, transfer peaks at younger ages, with about 13% of people in their late 20s and early 30s reporting having received one of these transfers, and the proportion of people reporting reception falling after that, with about 3% of people in their early 60s reporting having received one of these transfers. And this kind of points us towards what types of life events for receivers we're going to investigate. So things that like moving into home ownership, getting married, having a child that might happen at the kinds of ages where transfers are most common. And it also begins to point towards the way in which these transfers tend to be from, from older to younger people. And so kind of transfers in an intergenerational way. And this is again backed up when we look at who tends to be giving transfers. So here you can see the opposite pattern holding, where people in their late 20s, early 30s, about 3% of people in these age categories report having given one transfer above £500 in the last two years. And this rises to about 16% of people in their 60s. So you can really see that these transfers are kind of, they're taking place from older to younger people. And this is backed up when we look at some of the self-reported evidence on who transfers are received from that we get in round seven, which I'm going to show you here. And I'm showing you this for gifts only, but there's a very similar pattern that we see for loans when we look at them separately. So you can see that almost 70% of gifts are received from parents, with a further almost 10% received from great grandparents or great grandparents. And this shows us that not only are these transfers are kind of intergenerational phenomenon, but they're happening within families. And so potentially there are a way in which economic advantage is transmitted through generations. <laughs> 
And this pattern is kind of even further confirmed when we look at the proportion of gifts value re represented by different sources, which I show you here. And you can see that almost 90% of gift value is received from parents, really pointing towards the importance of parent-child connections in determining the nature of these gift transfers. So one further feature of transfers I'm going to present before I go on to talk about our primary analysis of life events, which is the fact that these transfers tend to be received infrequently. So this shows you among people who report having received at least one transfer and who are present in all six of the waves that we look at, how many, trans how many waves did people report receiving a transfer in? And you can see that most people report only receiving a transfer in one wave, with a further about a quarter of the people reporting having received the transfer in two waves, but almost no one receiving them in more than that. And so rather than being a kind of continuous flow from parents to children, these transfers seem to be more of an infrequent or one-off phenomenon which further up our decision to look at life events as something that might prompt these large sums of money to be transferred. And so I'll go into some of the life events that we look at in particular as I go on. But I just want to talk a bit about what in particular we're doing. So because the Wealth and Asset Survey is a panel data set which follows the same people over time, we're able to construct measures of life events, measures so people's status changing between waves. And we test whether those status changes are associated with your probability of receiving or giving a transfer. And for example, we look at getting married between waves for receivers or becoming widowed between waves for givers, among other things. We run various OLS regression specifications, which test the association between whether you receive a transfer, a vector of kind of demographic characteristics, because you might think that some people are both more likely to receive transfers and more likely to experience life events. We're controlling for that. And then we control for various life events that I've just shown you in a table format. We also examine the amount received as an outcome, and we run an equivalent regression with giving as an outcome to test whether various life events seem to be significantly associated with a probability of giving a transfer. So here I'm going to present some of these results. So you can see that having moved into home ownership between waves, compared to someone similar who hasn't moved into home ownership between waves, seems to be associated with a 10 percentage point increase in your probability of receiving a transfer, pointing towards the importance of home ownership as a driver for receiving transfers. Marriage also seems to be another important driver, increasing the probability of receiving a transfer by nine percentage points. Moving region between waves and moving into self-employment from employment between waves also seem to be significantly associated with the higher probability of receiving at least one transfer over the last two years. And separation also seems to be significantly associated with the higher probability of receiving a transfer, although this is only just and there's a smaller effect than the others. For these next three events, the connection is not statistically significant. And this is potentially interesting because the events most connected with the higher probability of receiving a transfer are potentially more foreseeable, among other things, whereas stuff that's less predictable, like experiencing a decline in employment earnings or experiencing unemployment, don't seem to be associated with transfers. And this kind of helps us to understand the nature of these transfers. So maybe they're not functioning so much as family insurance, for example. Maybe they're a way of transmitting economic advantage through generations. And we can also look at the size of transfers. So this is among all adults. We can look at whether experiencing one of these events between waves seems to be associated with receiving more in transfer value than someone similar who didn't experience one of these events. Moving into home ownership seems to be associated with receiving about £2,500 more in transfer value compared to someone similar who didn't. And this could be acting through two channels. So one, which I just talked about, is the fact that you're more likely to receive a transfer if you've also moved into home ownership at the same time. And another one, which I'll go on to talk about on the next slide, is that among receivers, you could be receiving more if you've moved into home ownership compared to someone similar who also received a transfer but didn't move into home ownership. Marriage also seems to be associated with receiving slightly more in transfer value compared to someone who didn't get married. So, but then none of the rest of these events seem to be significantly and positively associated with receiving more in transfer value. Now, when we look only at those who've received a transfer, you can see that home ownership, people who've moved into home ownership between waves, compared to people who've received a transfer but not moved into home ownership between waves, seem to be receiving around £10,000 more in transfer value. So as the other two sites have shown, this really backs up the importance of home ownership and driving really large transfers, not only 
transfer support, but really large amounts of money. None of the rest of these events are significantly associated with receiving much more in transfer value than otherwise similar people who haven't experienced one of these events. So now I'm going to show you some self-reported evidence from round seven, which kind of backs up some of the stuff that we've been looking up at so far. It's useful complement because it allows us to look at life events that are harder to get at in the way that we've been doing it so far. So for example, whether someone reports using a gift for living expenses or whether they report using it for a holiday, which we don't really have the variables to get at in words. And so this shows you the proportion of gifts used for various different self-reported reasons in round seven. And as you can see, property purchase seems important, with 23% of gifts received used for property purchase or improvements. But there are other important uses that come through here too. There are many gifts are used for living expenses, many are saved or invested, the other, others are used for holidays, for vehicle expenses or for other reasons. But when we look at the proportion of gifts value represented by various different uses, property really stands out as being very important. So here I show you a pie chart that represents the proportion of gift value used for various different reasons. And as you can see, more than half of gift value was put towards property purchase or improvements. And this is another way of kind of backing up what we've seen so far, which is that property purchase is really important in prompting large gifts in particular. And we see a really similar pattern when we look at loans, which I'll show you now. So again, when we look at the proportion of loans used for different reasons, property is important, but as are various different reasons like debt repayments, Again, living expenses and vehicle payments, among other things. But when we look at the proportion of loan value used for different reasons, property again represents more than half of the total value used. Finally, I'm going to talk about some life events for givers that might be associated with a higher probability of making a transfer. And this is to try and kind of get at what's driving some of these transfers from the giver side of things, whether these gifts are solely responsive to events like home ownership for receivers, or whether there might also be some events in givers' lives that prompt transfers. Having been widowed between waves compared to someone otherwise similar who has not been widowed between waves is associated with an almost 15 percentage point higher likelihood of making a transfer over the last two years. And having inherited also has a statistically significant association between with making a transfer of over 500 pounds, increasing the probability by six percentage points. These next three events, though, don't have a statistically significant association between experiencing those and making a transfer. And this is quite interesting because unlike what we saw for receivers, being widowed and inheriting seem relatively different to foresee, especially when compared to the other three events that we look at, which don't seem to be associated with a higher probability of making a transfer. So whereas foreseeable events seem to be driving transfers for receivers, this doesn't seem to be so much the case for givers. So I've shown you that transfer value and transfer prevalence seem to be slightly increasing in recent years in particular, which might reflect some of the reasons to think that these transfers are playing an increasingly important role in people's lives. Talked about the kind of relationship between givers and receivers, which tends to be parent-child in nature, and the fact that these transfers are working on an intergenerational within family basis. Talked about the events that seem to be associated with transfer behaviour, so becoming a home ownership, marrying and becoming self-employed in particular. And we've seen that home ownership is particularly important in prompting very large gifts. And then for givers, it seems that events that might prompt transfers are less predictable. So things like inheriting and being widowed, whereas we don't see a strong association with other events that might change how people are holding their wealth, like drawing a pension or paying off a mortgage. And that's it for me. Welcome any, any questions. <laughs>